time, Palantir shares are in the red, down about 5% right now after reporting results that were in line with estimates. Full year guidance was above estimates. The company also announcing a billion dollar share buyback plan. But joining us now is Founders Fund partner and an early Palantir employee, Trey Stevens. Trey, it's great to have you on the show. Good to see you, Morgan. How's it going? Great. So I so much to talk to you about, but let's start with Palantir here because it really seems like the bright spots last quarter uh, were U.S. commercial and also international government in terms of uh, revenue growth. But this is really a company that's just posted a third consecutive quarter of profitability. And perhaps the biggest story here is artificial, the artificial intelligence platform, which speaks to all the generative AI discussions and investments and opportunities that we've been talking about day in, day out on CNBC, but where Palantir is concerned, you're talking about it in real time with sensitive data and government contracts. That's right, yeah. AIP is Palantir's fourth platform. Um, obviously, the original product was called Gotham, and then they added Foundry and Apollo to that, um, the artificial intelligence platform being the most recent. Uh, you know, it's really important to address the core problems of large enterprises, which uh, is really enabling these large language models that have grown in popularity to run on private networks, on private data. Um, the safe handoff between existing legacy systems that are already used by the enterprise, as well as the enterprise-grade governance that's required to make that stuff work in a secure way, uh, is something that Palantir is really uniquely suited to provide and, you know, has been kind of the MO of what they've been working on uh, since they were originally founded. Yeah. I mean, Palantir is publicly traded, but you're also the co-founder and chairman of Andrel, uh, which is private, at least for now, um, but is another name that's been growing very strongly, has, has a strong valuation in the private markets. I mean, is defense tech having its moment right now, given some of these AI applications, but also given the geopolitical landscape? Well, you know, I think it, Andrew is in a unique position in, that we kind of got to ride on the shoulders of giants. You know, we learned so much from the experiences at SpaceX and at Palantir um, that we were it, we were kind of in a pole position to run really fast with the with those lessons. Um, I, I think since 2017, when we originally started Andrew, there's certainly been a lot of additional momentum piling into the defense tech industry. Some of that is related to uh, the government being a kind of re recession resilient. Uh, customer uh, in the midst of a uh, of a, a minor economic uh, situation, as we're all tracking, um, but also the geopolitical realization with the war in Russia well, between Russia and Ukraine, uh, as well as increased tensions with China. So I think there's a, an opportunity that a lot of people are seizing on that they believe that there's something really real that uh, that might be worth checking out. Um, but it, uh, you know. I'm cautiously optimistic, given that this all relies on the government having a behavioral change around the way that they treat the transition of pilots and prototypes, research and development projects into uh, production, which is still kind of lagging uh, the market on the private side. Yeah. And what you just said uh, is really key here, because when we're talking about some of these companies that are, quote unquote, dual use technology, I think I think investors, at least in the public markets, can understand commercial applications when a Palantir says that it's growing by double digits, for example, last quarter. But the defense piece of it. It's that we, you hear about it in defense circles a lot, the, the valley of death. Is policy building that bridge to, to get over the valley of death for some of these startups right now that are winning some of these early contracts or some of these early development awards, but then still need to grow and still need to see those revenues in a more sustainable way? Uh, you know, policy is, is maybe not the exact part of it. It's not the exact problem. Um, there are a lot of ways that you could change law, that you can move things around to make uh, the transition easier. Uh, most of this is going to be behavioral and cultural, though. You know, decision making uh, to get new entrants into the market. Uh, we shouldn't forget that it took a long time for Palantir and SpaceX to finally hit their stride into production. Um, obviously, things are going really well now. Um, and really, those are two companies uh, that went government first and then transitioned into commercial. And uh, that's it's a really unique motion. Uh, I'm not surprised by Palantir's continued dominance on the commercial side of things, you know, uh, showing over 20 percent growth, um, closer to like 40 percent growth if you if you take the SPAC side of the thing, things out of it. So uh, they've really been crushing on that front. And I think a lot of that is from building a real enterprise grade product 
um, uh, working with the government over the last you know decade plus. And so this is you know kind of the experience that we expect to see at Anderil that we're looking to see from our other portfolio companies that are working in the defense sector, like figuring out how you can go in, have a real impact at a product on a production level, um, and shift the culture of the government towards the new entrants that have the ability to build the capabilities that will be required for the future.